I had an unusual experience uh, the other day. Uh, I preached a very simple word at the funeral of one of our long-standing members. And to help you understand what I mean by the word simple, uh, my weekly sermons can often take between 15 and maybe to 25 hours to prepare as I do reading and writing and editing and often do a second and third and sometimes even a fourth draft before it gets to the pulpit. But for a funeral, after I've met with the family, uh, I take some intentional time to pray, uh, reflecting on that meeting and just trying to listen for what God might have to say. And sometimes I feel a clear sense of what I need to speak at that funeral, and sometimes I don't. But either way, whether I have some clarity or not, it's usually on the morning of the funeral I sit down for just about an hour. I set aside an hour or two to just gather my thoughts what I might say at the funeral that day. And I want to say that it's not laziness. It's just that I don't think preachers should preach much at funerals. I think that um, something does need to be said, but I don't think it should be too much. I think people need to hear a word from God in their grief, but I think it ought to be brief and simple and to the point. So, so I make my preparation time brief and simple and to the point. What was different this week, though, the unusual experience was that after this funeral, a number of people came to speak to me about the word that I had spoken. Um, And most of them were from from people whose voices I really trust. They're sensible people. They're thoughtful people. Um, All the people who spoke to me have walked long with the Lord. And so I thought, this is so interesting that there would be this, this surge, if you like, of comment from the people who were there. And some of the people were saying that this is a word that should be preached on a Sunday morning. And for me, I, I, I was really uncertain about it because the word seemed so obvious, as you will see in a moment, so simple. Uh, and, and this is a word that these people would have heard often over the years. And I, I wondered what it was in the moment. Um, because if I were to preach this word on a Sunday, it's not, it's not a funeral. And I think that words that come at a funeral often have unique power because they are preached from behind a coffin to a grieving family in a very emotionally charged environment. And I really do believe that the power of the word of God comes as God seeks, not human beings, as God seeks to comfort a grieving family. And so, so I was I was cautious that the, that what these folk had heard and felt um, was a word for that moment and not for another day. But as we transition from Exodus and into a new season, which I'm still wrestling to discern what that should be, uh, and it's a communion Sunday in our church, I thought, well, let me take that prompting from the people and let me share a few thoughts that emerged from that funeral homily. I've tweaked a little, but in essence, it's the heart of that word that I spoke there. And I'm grateful I've asked permission from the family. I'm grateful to the family for allowing me to use it uh, this week. And so let me begin by simply observing this. Our word for today, your word, my word, our word for today is life. Life. Not death. Life. The way the Gospel writer John writes his Gospel, he keeps telling us that Jesus is all about life. And for a long time, I've found this sentence of Jesus in John chapter 10 to be quite remarkable. Let's listen to it again with me. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. I have come that you may have life. Theologians write books. The theologians in 2024 still writing books about why Jesus came. But in John's Gospel, Jesus makes it quite straightforward, quite plain as this. I have come that you may have life. Christmas time, Easter time, the kind of two bookends of the Jesus story and everything in between all happened, says Jesus in John's Gospel, for one reason. For one reason, that we may have life. 
And so I thought I would observe three ways in which God gives us life and invites us into life. The first one I want to say, and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of this, is that Jesus comes so that we will live well. I don't mean ostentatiously, I just but that we would live well. Jesus came so that this life that has been given to us would be lived well. His desire, God's desire, is that human beings should flourish, that we should live in this world, he says in John chapter 10, abundantly, fully, completely, contentedly, if you like. In other words, to say it differently, we should receive this life as a gift, and then with God's help to make the very most of what we have. Not not to be complacent about this, but to receive this life as a gift and to live it as well as we are able with God's help. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said in one of his rules of a helper, he said, never be unemployed a moment, never be triflingly employed, never while away time. Wesley was a bit of a radical and so he often said quite extreme things, but he has the right idea. Life is too, too precious to waste. Jesus came, he says, not only that we would live, but that we would live abundantly, fully, well. Live life well. The second observation I want to make about Jesus' word that he came that we may have life is to say that Jesus' answer to all the struggles of this world in John's Gospel Jesus' answer to all the struggles was to bring life. That was how he responded. That's how he reacted, if you like. Uh, Some of these aren't in John's Gospel, but just to make the point, they ran out of wine at a wedding. The host was embarrassed. What does Jesus do? He turns water into wine. He brings life. People were hungry. And so he takes the loaves and fish of a little boy and he turns it into a meal for 5,000 people. He brings life. A woman suffered with an illness for 12 years. She'd been to many doctors. She was despairing and Jesus heals her. He brings life. The famous story in John's Gospel is that Jesus' friend Lazarus dies after a short illness and Jesus goes and literally raises him from the dead. He brings life. If you trace the life of Jesus, there is life wherever he goes. That's Jesus' calling card. That's how you could tell if he had visited your village. When he left, somehow, some kind of life was left behind. And so God's deep desire for you, in whatever your and my circumstances may be, is that we would find healing in a way that would help us to find life. Whatever life's challenges have brought us over the years, whatever life's challenges we are in now, God's desire is that we would find the kind of healing that would enable us to find life. It would be true to say that wherever God is present, whenever and wherever God is present, He is conspiring, He is looking for ways to bring life into the world and into your life and mine. And so my quick observation on this second point is to say, open your door, open the door of your life to God so that he can bring life to you. Be conscious of doing that. Pray it even. Lord, I open my life that you might bring life into mine. And then finally, the third observation is that Jesus, all the way through the Gospels and notably in John's Gospel, reveals himself as not only the bringer of life, but the conqueror of death. We cannot escape the reality of death in our world. And when you conduct a funeral, it is very, it's very present. You stand literally alongside a coffin. Death is there. Um, But I'm, I'm not referring only to the death of our bodies. In the world in which we live, death is all around us. Um, we spoke of some of these things last week, but there, there are all kinds of decay that go on in our world. 
and whether it's in relationships or cities or or um, governments, there's decay. All the death is all around us, and this is the thing. Jesus reveals himself and Jesus declares himself to be the conqueror of death. And what that means is that death will not have the final word. This is what we declare. This is what the gospel is. Uh, This is what we claim to believe. This is what I invite you to believe today, that death, in whatever the circumstances, will not have the final word. It does speak. It's unavoidable. It's present to us. We confront it every day. But the gospel is, it will not have the final word. At At a funeral, the coffin is not the final word. Death is not the final word. Life is the final word. In whatever tragedy, challenge, or even opportunity that you're encountering in life, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the promise that life and not death, will have the final word over us. And God bless you, and Amen.